Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Kevin Murphy. I work for the Mineralogical Society. Um, what we're attending today is uh, an open geoscience talk of the Applied Mineralogy Group. And we have apologies from Alicia and from Emer, uh, the, the, the treasurer and the chair of the group, respectively, who were unable to, to join us today. Alicia, at the last minute, had to, had to pull out. So, so you're, you're left with me to do this introduction. Um, this is a series of, of talks that the group has been running over the past several months, and uh, Martin Smith at Brighton has kindly agreed to, uh, to, to give us this talk, and you can see his first slide on your screen today. Uh, he's a professor of geochemistry and currently the Associate Dean for Research and Enterprise in the School of Applied Sciences at the University of Brighton. Since getting his PhD at the University of Leeds in 1995, He's gained 25 years experience in research in geochemistry and mineralogy applied to problems in mineral deposits genesis, hydrogeology and environmental mineralogy. For the past six years, he has been working on a collaborative project with civil engineers and microbiologists on mineralogy and environmental controls on marine steel corrosion, starting with the industry funded MAPOMIC project and currently on the EU RDF Interreg 2 Seas project, Socorro, seeking out corrosion. Martin, I'm just going to hand it straight over to you and invite you to, uh, to give us your talk. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for the introduction, Kevin, and thank you for everybody for attending. So what I want to talk about is work that has originally arisen out of an industry-funded project um, with a wide range of people, but I'll particularly flag here Richard Brennan, because part of this formed part of his PhD. And I'm really pleased to see Richard's here in the audience today. Um, this was called Mapamix, so the metagenomics and physicochemistry of microbially, microbially influenced corrosion. Um, and it's developed now because the team at Brighton is now part of an Interreg 2C's um, EU RDF funded project, Socorro, um, and I won't read out the list of people involved in there. I'm glad to see, again, lots of people in the audience. Um, but I will be trying to acknowledge everybody who's involved in that right at the end of the, um, the talk. Um, and I'll also acknowledge just at the start two ports local to Brighton, Shoreham Port and New Haven um, Port, who've been really instrumental in a lot of the, allowing a lot of the work we've done here. But as Kevin said, this is mineralogy at the interface between microbiology, um, environmental geoscience, environmental geochemistry, and civil engineering. Because what we're concerned with is um, marine steel corrosion. So we had some recent estimates around this. Um, global multi-billion pound um, euro or dollar um, problem and there have been estimates that it costs amounting around to around 3.8 percent of the EU GDP and it's generally viewed as inevitable and although there are remedial techniques that can be used um, companies tend to deal with it as it arouses so anything we can do to increase understanding of mechanisms identify risk factors and identify markers that might allow us to predict corrosion risk is going to be useful. Um, when we start looking at marine corrosion, we've got a range of relatively poorly understood com complications. The first thing is that when we look at this, something like this, this is a steel pile wall at Shoreham Harbour on the south coast of the UK. Um, the corrosion rate is strongly influenced by environmental factors. Um, so things like water pH, water temperature, nutrient availability, and it's further complicated by the growth of things like this. So this is what I'm going to talk about for most of this um, session. These orange blisters, they're evidence of microbial influence, microbially influenced corrosion. Basically, these orange blisters are full of bacteria um, and they enhance corrosion rates. So this is the problem we've set out to tackle. Um, and it's particularly important at the moment. We've got expanding marine infrastructure. We've got new offshore wind farms going in, coastal sites where um, marine energy production infrastructure comes on shore, all of which are increasing the amount of material we're putting into the marine realm. And particularly things that um, are in the intertidal zone can be 
subject to very rapid corrosion rates. Now, the reason for this is basically it starts out electrochemical. So if we take out the microbial factors in the intertidal zone, we have steelwork that's exposed to air and forms a cathodic area where we're reducing oxygen from the atmosphere and an anodic area where we've got submerged steelwork where we're oxidizing iron. And the interface between those two zones is well known as a rate for very high corrosion rates. So if we look at an example like this, where we have differential aeration um, extending from fully atmospheric oxygen levels down to anoxia, we get very high, um, we get high attack rates in the low water zone anyway, up to about 0 0.75075 millimeters per year. Um, and that's at least double what we'd usually get in um, above the tidal zone, immediately above this area. So we've got enhanced corrosion rates on intertidal or low water steelwork anyway, because of the electrical chemical environment. When people have gone and looked at corrosion rates, so this is work by um, Melchers published in 2008. And what he's tried to do here is generalize um, what usually happens with marine corrosion rates. So we have initial electrochemical corrosion, we have colonization of steel surface by organisms, and we get a corrosion rate that's controlled by the diffusion rate of oxygen from seawater. And over time, eventually, we get a thick coating of corrosion products on marine steelwork, and the corrosion rate slows down because the iron oxides and oxyhydroxides are reducing the corrosion rate. But at some point where we've had long-term monitoring of marine steelwork, we start to see a sudden dramatic increase in corrosion rate. And this is where bacterial colonization and bacteria appear to have a major role in influencing corrosion. This change in corrosion rate is because life is getting involved with these processes. So what particularly interested at Brighton and brought us into the, this area initially was this phenomenon called accelerated low water corrosion. So we sit in that low water corrosion area, um, low water enhanced corrosion area, and we bring in the microbial factors on top of that. And that combination of factors can give up to 0.5 to a millimeter year um, loss of thickness from marine steelwork. That's up to five times reduction in the lifespan of marine steelwork. So it's a major cause of coastal marine infrastructure failures. Um, what people have determined from previous work, um, this is a diagram based on a Syria uh, manual, is we see a living stratum, um, macrobiota and microbiota, so mollusks, algae, all sorts of things, colonize the steel. We get a range of corrosion products over the top of that and protected from the, anoxic, the oxic environment, we get a sulfidic sludge, which includes sulfate reducing bacteria. So people are aware that sulfate reducing bacteria are involved in this process. And for anyone who's ever looked at microbial diagenesis, this generalized equation for what's happening is fairly familiar we get bacteria that reduce sulfate from the water column um, in, under anaerobic conditions. Um, they're produced hydrogen sulfide. They're using that to metabolize organic matter. The reduced hydrogen sulfide reacts with iron and generates macinawite or pyrite. Um, so that core process is happening on the steel surface in the marine environment. And we get really dramatic failures. So the initial work we carried out on this at Brighton was based at Shore and Port, south coast of the UK. Um, and we're now working by the Interreg program with New Haven, South End, and there's a range of colleagues here from France and Belgium as well, part of that project. And so in theory, we should also be doing some of this work on Ostend as well. But COVID has um, kind of curtailed the amount we can go and visit one another's experimental sites. So I'm going to talk exclusively about Shoreham, New Haven and South End on Sea. So the current project led by Antwerp Maritime Academy, um, partners including Ghent, Lille, 
Leuven, uh, Hoa de France, Artois, Kent, um, Brighton, of course, and eight industrial partners. And what we're trying to do now, having built on previous work, and I'm going to talk about the whole pro two programs in one, is look at ultimately to produce a publicly available algorithm for predicting corrosion risk, for improved corrosion management, um, cost and safety control in marine installations, um, improved renewable energy infrastructure, um, improved water quality and water management. The Brighton part of that, which builds on our previous work, is to look at microbially influenced corrosion mechanisms. We've already, from the original MAPAMIC project, identified mechanisms at UK sites. We want to know if those operate elsewhere. And then what can we feed into a risk algorithm from what we know about microbially influenced corrosion um, risk factors? So we get to do some really exotic field work. This is Shoreham Harbour at low tide. We've got, oh, excuse me, typical estuarine muds here. And you can see immediately below the surface, they're very, very dark in colour. So this is the key, one of the key factors we've got to identify first. We've got extensive evidence where we have microbial influence corrosion problems that we've got sulfate reducing bacteria in the environment anyway. And what we were initially concerned about are these features, these orange blisters. Um, these are taken purely simple visual evidence of this phenomenon called accelerated low water corrosion. If we chip one of these away, under that structure, we can actually see acid etch steelwork. So this is not oxide in there, that is clean steel. So what is going on inside those blisters is generating acidity and that is enhancing the corrosion rate and it's directly acid etching the steel. So that's what we want to understand. Um, lots more fieldwork going on. We get nice access from working with things like floating uh, pontoons so we can access different heights at different states of the tide. This again is at Shoreham. We've been looking at environmental factors from water sampling um, within the water column um, and lots of sediment sampling in this case at South End. Um, South End Pier there is also a major corroding steel structure in the intertidal environment and lots and lots of corrosion sampling. So if I turn back to Mapamic, what we first set out to test, um, the phenomenon of accelerated low water corrosion was well recognized. Um, what wasn't known is where the causative bacteria were coming on from. So the initial hypothesis, just taking a simple source pathway receptor model, is that we've got sulfate reducing bacteria that are responsible for sulfate reduction and pyrite generation in the bed sediment that are resuspended. They have a limited survival time in the water column. And during that survival time, they're colonizing anaerobic microenvironments on the steelwork caused by um, macrobiofilms, algae, um, mollusks, and so on. And we've got potential colonies of both sulfate reducing and oxidizing bacteria. So this was the starting idea. And one of the lines of evidence we want to deal with that is what the mineralogy is of the corrosion products. Um, previous work, the Mixby project, which we weren't involved with, but suggested that we've got very specific iron oxide between normal low water thermochemical corrosion and these microbially influenced accelerated low water corrosion processes. So we get an up outer surface of calcium carbonate from macroorganisms, we get girtite, then magnetite, and then green rusts. And I'll say a little bit more about green rusts in a second. When we get microbially influenced corrosion, the suggestion is that then we're getting lipidocrocite, different crystal structure of iron oxyhydroxides. Um, no magnetite, but green rusts extensively developed. Green rusts are essentially um, a range of mixed iron oxidation state, either carbonate or sulfate um, minerals. And we're getting iron sulfides against the steel surface. So we need to test that um, mineralogical structure to the corrosion to work towards understanding the determining mechanisms. And then we can hopefully build towards understanding what's going on and doing something about it. So this was our initial sampling points, Shoreham Harbour in the UK, 
We've got within the main harbour where we've got a fixed water level by lock gates. We don't get tidal variation. And a main study site, the dredger berth here, which is tidal. The approach to actually characterizing those corrosion blisters, we sampled both what appears to be normal marine corrosion, and I'll get on for a moment the fact that it's actually very difficult to identify in this particular site something that isn't influenced by bacteria. And we coupled microbial analyses with mineralogy and chemistry. And the approach took in X ray diffraction, um, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, um, and X ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So we're going from quite high end research techniques through to things that we can hopefully. Um, apply very cheaply and convert to in situ analysis techniques that might assist in early recognition, remediation and prevention. So the first thing is when we look at X-ray diffraction patterns, so this is two theta against intensity, um, iron rich samples, unfortunately with copper K alpha, so we get high backgrounds, but we can see lepridocrockite, we can see magnetite, we can see pyrite, and throughout all of this microbially inference corrosion type material, we get green rusts. So if you're not used to green rust, it is actually something that has a formally recognized mineral formula and structure. So it's called min rust, min green rust, but it is a recognized phase. And what it is, is iron 2, iron 3 hydroxide sulfate hydrated. And that includes components of amarantite, so iron 3 oxysulfate and rosinite iron 2 oxysulfate. So a really diagnostic part of some of these corrosion blisters is the occurrence of iron sulfates in with the oxide corrosion products. And if we just go in and chemically analyze some of those corrosion blisters, we get a strong differential between these bright orange rapid corrosion blisters and what we call normal corrosion in the amount of sulfur that's present. So the sulfur metab um, metabolism and the sulfur mineralogy is really important in terms of what is going on in these structures. Um, these are just some SEM images of what some of this material looks like. So we see a laminated iron oxide um, material. It has a number of peculiar structures in it. These are either iron oxides or iron carbonates. In this case, we can actually see some bacilli on surfaces. If we look at the interior of those blisters, what we see is very fine grained microcrystalline to amorphous iron sulfides, um, probably macanawite, um, alongside well crystalline green rusts, iron sulfate phases. And you can see that in very high magnification here, platy green rust minerals alongside acicular iron oxides of various sorts. Um, when we look at the infrared spectra of these things, so this is wave number against absorbance, we see the sulfate minerals, but we also see a lot of evidence of intermediate oxidation state sulfur compounds. So here we've got um, absor infrared absorbance for iron oxides, iron oxyhydroxides, but also sulfates, which we already know are there, but also fire sulfate. So we're not just seeing sulfur sulfate minerals and sulfide minerals, we're seeing the intermediate oxidation states are present as well. Um, and this becomes really important when we start to understand the mechanism of what's going on. The reason for tackling this with infrared spectroscopy is partly it allows us to identify these amorphous phases, but also this is something we can turn hopefully into a um, field deployable rapid identification technique. I just want to focus on this point here as well. This is where we get um, bisulfate and um, pyrite absorption bands. And where we've tried to differentiate normal marine corrosion and accelerated local water corrosion at Shoreham as part of the MAPAMIC project, it's quite clear we've got sulfur species present in both um, corrosion types. So we have the precursor generation of sulfate minerals in what appears to be normal marine corrosion, where we've got small pockets of anoxia that allow the initial colonization, potentially by sulfate reducing bacteria, that then develop into 
the major problem accelerated low water corrosion blisters. And I can say that because the more recent data, so this isn't um, this is in transmittance rather than absorption because this is relatively recent data. Um, Biji Shibalal is a postdoc working on this at the moment, who also I think is here today. But this is from South End on Sea. And the important thing here, just flip the axis in assess essence because this is unprocessed um, infrared spectroscopy data, is we're seeing lots of goethite, we're seeing lepridocrocite, we're not seeing those strong sulfide and sulfate absorption bands. So when we get into tidal corrosion without, um, we suspect without strong bacterial influence, we're not seeing the sulfur species absorption in infrared spectra. So we have a route, a ra fairly rapid route for assessing um, the mineralogy to check for sulfur species. And this is something we want to um, develop further into a rapid assessment technique for risk assessment, um, for feeding our, the risk al algorithms. This is great, but it has been on bulk samples or purely directly onto the surface of corrosion. What we want to do is understand the structure of those blisters and tackle the actual um, mechanisms of what is causing this accelerated corrosion process. So this is where we've turned to X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And I'll just say a little bit about that, how that works. It might not be as familiar, it might be. Um, there may be people here who know more about it than I do. But essentially what we're doing in XPS is firing um, X-ray, aluminium X-rays at an energy of 1,486 electron volts at a sample. That has a penetration depth, same as most other uh, microbeam techniques. And this isn't necessarily a microbeam technique laterally. And we have a spot size of around 200 microns to a millimeter. But that causes um, extra excites atoms and we emit X-rays from the surface. And we only get electron emission from the first few tens of nanometers. So vertically, this is a nanoscale surface analysis technique. And we measure the binding energy spectrum. Um, and the beauty of this in terms of the binding energy is that sent the binding energy of electrons in a given compound metal element is sensitive to redox state. So by targeting um, binding energy measurement, we can look at redox as well as the elemental composition. Um, we couple this with an argon um, ablation beam and we can sputter into the corrosion surface, sample surface, and look at changes through the structure of those blisters. Um, there are issues with that because Firing an argon plus beam at the sample surface can induce its own redox chemistry. But just to demonstrate what's going on here, these are binding energy spectra of iron and sulfur 2p electrons ablated over 45 cycles with the argon plus beam. And we ablated into laboratory reagent grade iron hydrated iron sulfate samples here just to demonstrate we're not seeing oxidation or reduction of sulfur during the ablation process. So this is the end product of a sample viewed after we've um, done an XPS depth transfect into it. We can see the crystal structure of the sulfate minerals. On the outer surface, you can see biofilm developed. And at the edge of the ablation crater here, you can see where that argon beam has cut across minerals within the corrosion structure. So that gives us the elemental composition with depth into one of these corrosion um, samples. So what we've done in this case is take a sample, split it in half, um, inverted one half, and we've depth profiled from the outer surface inwards and from the inner surface outwards, which is why the scales are inverted on these two plots. But what you can see, we go from a few atomic percent sulfur in the outer part of the material up to around 10 atomic percent sulfur at the steel surface. So the yellow line here is the sulfur concentration going into that corrosion sample. This was supposedly normal marine corrosion and we've still got sulfur contents here. When we look at an accelerated low water corrosion sample, we say the same thing, but higher sulfur concentrations. So we're going up to 15% sulfur towards the steel surface as we profile into these materials. 
So for each of these points, we can then abstract a, uh, a binding energy spectra and look at the actual chemical state of the elements we've analyzed for there. So this is a sample from New Haven Harbor taken as part of the Socorro project. Um, and this is a sulfur 2p electron binding energy spectra. Um, what I've got here, I've plotted this out in detail. So the black points are actual measurements. The green solid line coming across the whole spectrum there is the fitted curve. And the individual peaks are the peaks we fitted to deconvolute that spectrum. Um, slight complication in interpreting these is that for each um, potential compound, we get two peaks. And I don't want to go into the um, physics of this, but that's essentially because of the spin coupling of the electrons within the orbitals, which means we get energy splitting. Um, so we get two binding energy peaks for each compound. But with that, we can see in this, this is the interior of one of these accelerated low water corrosion blisters. We've got iron monosulfide, macinarwhite, we've got iron bisulfide, pyrite, um, and we've got very low down in the noise peaks for um, fire sulfate, sulfite, and sulfate. If we look at a similar plot for um, the exterior of one of these blisters, the bright red parts, we lose the, the sulfide um, peaks. And now we can see very clearly we've got thiosulfate, we have sulfite, and we have sulfate. So we're capturing the whole redox chemistry of sulfur through a few millimeters of steel corrosion. And when we compile that over a whole series of sputtering experiments, we can see we go from an outer surface with iron sulfates, progressively higher concentrations of sulfides as we go in, and we get right into the inner surfaces that are dominated by sulfide minerals. So that's data we originally collected at Shoreham. We've now expanded on this in more recent projects at Coro, but we can see the same phenomena going on in different samples and across different sites. So at Shoreham, we see outer surfaces with high concentrations of sulfate, sulfate and intermediate um, oxidation state sulfur compounds. We see um, uh, macinarwhite and pyrite, monosulfide and bisulfide against the steel surface. We see the same sort of compositional change at New Haven. When we go to somewhere like South Undone Sea, we have looked there at both splash zone um, corrosion and intertidal corrosion, we do not see the same thing going on. So we've got a separate site where we do not have evidence for this involvement of sulfate reducing bacteria in the corrosion process. And just to make that a little bit clearer, this is a sample from New Haven. It's a plot, a contoured plot of um, the full ablation process. Um, and we can see the outer surface, a very slight sulfate um, peak there. As we profile deeper and deeper in, we move to sulfide dominated corrosion mineralogy. And we don't see any of that at South End. So superficially similar environments, intertidal steelwork, but we now have sites where we can use to look at what are the risk factors. Um, and you can see we've got a thinner estuarine sediment layer at South End on Sea, but we're working at the moment on establishing exactly why this is different. But what that has allowed us to do is establish a mineralogical structure to the accelerated low water corrosion. So we go through girtite, magnetite, magmite, and green rust compounds, the iron sulfates. Um, involved in that, somewhere we have amorphous phases that include thiosulfate and sulfite. And then against the steel surface, we've got iron sulfides. So we've got a really accurate picture now of what the mineralogy of these microbially influenced marine steel corrosion, um, low water, accelerated low water corrosion blisters are. So what we desperately need to do then is establish what is causing that. And this is where we move to microbiological analyses. So the three approaches initially taken as part of MAPAMIC, and we're extending some of these into the Socorro project now, the first is microarray, the geochip approach. So this is 
a silicon chip mounted functional gene array that targets key functional genes. And we specifically targeted sulfur cycle genes in using that approach. We've also got more traditional 16S sequencing. So this is um, species identification, what bacteria are present. And in between that, we've been trying to develop a technique that is a rapid assessment of the microbiology. So traditional gel um, electrophoresis techniques start with um, melting um, the DNA so that we can actually measure the melt curve and the different genes that are present will change the temperature that the DNA unravels at. It's a precursor to other techniques, but purely and simply in terms of the temperature profile, different microbial populations should have similar melting curve, sorry, different melting curves. So we can use this alongside more detailed techniques to try and establish if we've got the same populations through much wider range of samples. And this is something that hopefully we can develop into a rapid diagnostic technique. So the first thing to look at here is the fact that in terms of um, sulfur biogeochemical cycling, we have genes operating throughout these um, sample types. And here we've got samples from microbial influence corrosion, um, water samples, sediment samples. We have sulfate reduction going on, but we've also got sulfide oxidation. We've got different um, parts of the sulfur cycle, all as active genes within the microbial populations within those corrosion samples. So we can identify the individual genes that are active, particularly DSRA A and B, responsible for sulfate reduction, but then genes that are responsible for sulfur oxidation. So coupling that with um, SR, 16 sRNA analysis to identify the bacterial species, we can actually couple, uh, put together an idea of what the sulfur cycling processes are going on in this corrosion material. So the central diagram here is from Hansel 2015. It summarizes the cycling between sulfate and bisulfide and the intermediate oxidation states that are going on in there. In the boxes around it and labeled with the gene activity, we can now say within a single corrosion sample, we have sulfate reduction going on. We have microbially mediated sulfur oxidation going on. And we have disproportionation. We have organisms that take intermediate oxidation state sulfur compounds, so sulfite, fire sulfate, and use them as both electron donors and electron acceptors and produce hydrogen sulfide and sulfate. And we've got a huge number of bacteria in each case using those different metabolic pathways. So essentially there's a huge amount of functional redundancy in these processes. We don't have to have exactly the same population in different sites to cause this same corrosion problem. And it's allowed us to put together this idea of what actually is going on. So sorry, this is a horrendous diagram, huge number of, of equations on it, but essentially we have at the steel surface, sulfate reduction, generating hydrogen sulfide that's reacting to produce pyrite. We've then got sulfur oxidizing bacteria and probably iron oxidizing bacteria that are converting that sulfide into fire sulfate and sulfite, and ultimately back into sulfate. And at every stage of that microbial mediated metabolic pathway, we're generating acidity. We've got a little sulfuric acid factory forming on the steel surface. So this is what's responsible for the rapid marine corrosion rates. So what we want to know on that is where are those bacteria coming from? Why do we get different environments where we get the accelerated low water corrosion um, and environments where we don't? And what are the risk factors for these microbially influenced corrosion types? So we've looked at the water chemistry. We've looked at the harbour bed sediment. Um, and this is part of the uh, Mapamic project. This is Richard Brennan, who did his uh, um, PhD on this, and John Kaplan, who was the original microbiologist working as part of this programme. 
So the first thing is simple environmental parameters within these um, harbors. In warm summer months, we get seafloor anox sea, um, seabed anoxia extending into the base of the water column. So we have conditions that will allow um, bed sediment, sulfate reducing bacteria to get into the water column. This is a risk factor in terms of steel infection in the causative bacteria. If we look at the seawater chemistry, so we've got bromine chlorine here. Um, normal marine, normal seawater is the red point there. And we see dilution trends. It's what we'd expect for um, a typical um, estuarine environment. We do get some evidence of chloride addition over, so chloride in excess of bromide in relative to the normal seawater chlorine bromine ratio. So we've got some evidence of um, anthropogenic influence on the water quality. If we look at chloride against sulfate, we see reduction of sulfate, sulfate reducing compared to normal seawater. Um, so sulfate reduction going on, particularly in poor water samples and um, sulfur oxidation, presumably against the steel surface. And we also get evidence in this final plot, this is just looking at nitrate. And the points here towards high nitrate in that diagram are from dredged sediment, poor water samples. So we've actually got elevated nutrient contact um, levels in the poor water. And this is a strongly anthropogenically influenced um, harbor environment. So we're producing additional nutrients that might promote um, anoxia and the development of strong um, sulfate reducing bacterial populations in the bed sediment. We then move to um, sediment sampling, usually a straightforward coro with plastic um, core tube inside inserted into the bed sediment. We take pore water samples. So this is using a rhizon technique. It's a, mi a microporous bar, basically just connected up to syringes. And we take the pore water sample directly out of the tube. So with no exposure to atmosphere prior to analysis. And there's nothing new about these profiles. They've been seen in many, many sites worldwide, but the pore water sulfur goes down, the solid phase sulfur goes up, and we can attribute the reduction in the po total pore water sulfur to sulfate reduction and the formation of pyrite. So there's nothing unusual there, but it just tells us that the sulfate reducing bacteria are present in the bed sediment. So if we return to the microbiological analyses and we look at the sediment compared to um, the water column and the microbial samples, we're getting all the same sorts of gene activity, but when we look at the cluster analysis of the 16 RS, 16 sRNA profiles, we can see the bacterial consortia in the corrosion are most similar to sediment 50 centimeters below um, the seabed. And the seawater samples are most similar to sediment at the surface. So in terms of our original idea for the causative mechanism, we can be fairly confident now that the sulfate reducing bacteria that are responsible for the accelerated low water corrosion are coming from sulfate reducing bacteria populations in the bed sediment that are resuspended by dredging, by ship movement, colonizing steel surfaces. And then we've got these blisters forming where the outer surfaces are colonized by sulfide oxidizing bacteria. They're generating the green rusts, the iron sulfates. Um, and against the steel surface, where we've got local anoxic conditions, we've got sulfate reducing bacteria generating hydrogen sulfide against the steel surface. So we're getting, at least from shore, on a single site, a really clear idea of how the accelerated low water corrosion mechanism is operating. So the further work we're doing now as part of the Socorro project is to A, try to generalize that process. And we already seen, I've shown you data already from um, New Haven and South End that we can see in some sites, we can see the same processes going on in others we can't. So we want to confirm the MIC mechanisms and the risk factors. 
we want to develop further this approach for rapid identification of the bacterial communities. We want to develop the mineralogical approach to be really sure that we can identify this early on for targeting remediation work. And what interfaces with the rest of the Socorro project, um, teams uh, in France and Belgium have been working on laboratory experiments relating um, normal seawater monitoring parameters, pH, um, dissolved oxygen, redox potential to corrosion rate so that we can then take a simple monitoring approach um, to predicting corrosion risk that builds on this mechanistic understanding. So very briefly, we started to build a proce processes where we look at um, infrared spectroscopy. Can we use these for rapid identification of corrosion that has these sulfur compounds in there that is responsible for accelerated corrosion rates? And we've continued, we've got further work on going um, to look at um, identifying the microbial communities in different sites and are they the same as we've seen at Shoreham Harbour and this rapid diagnosis approach using high resolution melt curve analysis. And this is just an example of high resolution melt curve data. But what we have here is um, the melting curves for specific um, DNA sequences, temperature along the base, um, change in temperature up the side and we can see very clearly here this is this individual point speak here is from accelerated low water corrosion um, causing populations so this is part of the dsrb gene melting curve in seawater we don't see anywhere near as strong a development at that um, temperature peak and in the sediments shallow sediments match the seawater curve but we see the same melting curve in sediments at 50 centimeters depth. So we're really building on this idea that the local sediment is the source of the cause of bacteria. So we can identify a risk factor for marine infrastructure. Longer term, the aim of the Socorro project across all the partners is to look at monitoring of um, commonly used um, water quality parameters in the marine environment and link that to um, corrosion rate. So this isn't data um, from that project. This is previous data, but this is the type of data we're aiming to use. So we can see cyclic variation in redox potential. We can see cyclic variation in pH. Um, if we look at turbidity, we have periods where sediment resuspension is very high, which will be important for um, the remobilization of bacteria from bed sediment. And we see variation in things like dissolved oxygen. So this is the next stage of where we're going. These kind of data have been used in laboratory experiments now um, to try and build an algorithm that links to corrosion rate. And the next phase we have for field monitoring is we're actually going to install in situ water quality monitoring to look at conductivity, pH, dissolved oxygen, um, redox potential, temperature, chloride and chlorophyll, alongside monitors that will directly measure conductivity change in a steel strip so we can relate those factors to corrosion rate. And this is just catalogue photos of all this equipment because it's all in cardboard boxes on my lab floor at the moment. And we're going to install these hopefully in January if COVID doesn't throw us another curveball. So across those two projects, at least the Brighton part, um, we've recognized and identified the mechanism of accelerated low water corrosion. We can actually see that quite clearly now. We've got microbial formation of hydrogen sulfide, generation of uh, Mackinac white and pyrite. That's been oxidized again bacterially through a range of intermediate sulfur um, oxidation state sulfur compounds ultimately to produce green rusts. And that's an autocatalysized process. We're increasing pH, we're producing microenvironments within corrosion that encourage further development of sulfate uh, reducing bacterial colonies. And it encapsulates most of the mineral sulfur cycle. 
And that transitions between normal corrosion and these microbially influenced forms. When we go to sites that are affected by the microbially influenced corrosion, even when we look at material that isn't suffering from the obvious accelerated corrosion forms, we can still see the mineralogical evidence that these things are going on. And we can clearly um, differentiate thermochemical marine corrosion from microbially influenced corrosion using the sulfur mineralogy. So this is from the core science approach to what's going on, a useful application of mineralogy that we're hoping to build on. And that's gonna help us identify environmental risk factors, including using things like infrared spectroscopy. And it's gonna feed into the wider uh, monitoring approach that's been developed by the whole um, Socorro Consortium. And I said, I'd get to um, acknowledging everybody who's involved in that at the end of the um, program. So this is led by Antwerp Maritime Academy, but involves University of Lille, Ghent, um, Leuven, Brighton, the Polytechnic University of the Hauts de France, um, Artois, um, Kent, include, and also a wide range of ports, water treatment plants, shipping companies, um, steel companies, all feeding into um, what we hope will be an extremely useful final product, building from the Brighton perspective, at least, on some applied mineralogy. And I'll leave that there. Thank you very much, Martin. That, that, was, uh, that was really interesting, uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, nice, nice application of the subject that we, we all spend so much time talking about, I suppose. Um, I, I've invited people who are in the room to uh, to offer some some questions. Um, put them in the chat, and uh, um, we can we can put them to you. I don't I don't see any there yet. So so I suppose I, I just had a couple of things that myself to get the ball rolling. One was that. I can now be very knowledgeable as I paddle my kayak around ports in West Cork, tell everybody what these orange bloods are on the steel holding up the, uh, the harbour walls. Um, on a more serious note, um, you, you talked about um, uh, monitoring various factors, uh, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, and so on. Um, has, has there been any suggestion of monitoring uh, anthropogenic activity? Um, there's lots of marine traffic in and out of these uh, these places where you're gathering your data. One of the original questions we set to ask, because we the original project we started this was in development with Shoreham Port, and they had at least one idea that this, I mean, the, the actual phenomenon of accelerated low water corrosion was only identified in the 80s and there's been a debate from some people about whether the spread of it around the world, because it's now global, has been the spread of, um, like a disease, the spread of a causative organism, or it's just the spread of knowledge and people have started noticing it. Um, so one of the original questions was this moving around in ship ballast tanks. We've never tested that, but the core process that's going on in the sediment is not new. It's something hopefully, you know, everyone here, if you've done some uh, environmental science or some sedimentary geochemistry, sedimentary mineralogy at any point, we know goes on everywhere where we have, you know, um, bed sediment with a high organic content. So it looks very much that this phenomenon of just, we can do some basic um, sedimentology and identify sites that might be at risk of this um you know a real one of the things we're hoping in the next six months we have to look at is to look at what is different between south end on sea and shoreham and newhaven because we're not seeing this at um south end it's still an estuarine environment so um norman is chipping in there because this is where we are with this we've got um norman moles is on the brighton team for this looking at the sedimentary geochemistry and we are seeing grain size differences. We're seeing very shallow um, modern sediment at South End. Um, so we, we're having trouble coring there actually because we hit London clay within 20 centimeters of surface. So that development of thick um, organic rich sediments is potentially a major um, risk factor. And that's something we want to test in the next few months. Okay. Uh, we've got a question from Stefania. 
Uh, Stefania, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask your question yourself there? Yeah. Hello, I, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, uh, my question was um, mostly out of interest uh, regarding the sulfate, sulfate reducing bacteria because um, I'm interested to understand how deep uh, they can act uh, in terms of uh, creating the amorphous and then the crystalline uh, phases. So, and uh, what when happens you, when they, sorry. When you talk about depth, you're talking depth into the corrosion or depth into the bed sediment. Sorry, into, well, at, at this point, both. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think the fact that the, the initial oxide corrosion layers are porous is why they can colonize the steel surface because you get, um, if you've got algae colonizing the surface, barnacles, you know, any, any organisms colonizing the surface, then that's where we're getting anoxic microenvironments up in, you know, the intertidal zone where these things can colonize. So as long as there is, um, as long as there is pore space, I think they will colonize. Um, and there are a range of unusual things going on, not part of our work that other people have looked at. Um, electrocellular, so extracellular electron transfer is now a thing. So things that are running their metabolism by colonizing conductive surfaces. Um, and the redox chemistry that runs a cell metabolism is partly run outside the organism. So there is a lot of very unusual things going on in this area. Um, in terms of the sediment depth, um, I'm not the person to talk about that, but you know the microbial communities go right down into the bedrock. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So what, what I mean is that we can't really control once they are, um, once, uh, because I guess the up to 50 centimeters, so you were, um, considering and then after when they are buried further by new sediment we don't really know um, what happens further deep no i mean we have been sampling with hand corers so a meter is as deep as we can go um with the, te the techniques we've been using um in terms of harbors you know as i said one of the issues is dredging so they are stirring up sediment from deeper than 50 centimeters um a dredge, you know, every time they dredge the channel, they stir up turbidity clouds that are coming from a meet, meters down. So, you know, um, that activity will continue as long as there are nutrients. Um, so as long as long as there's still nutrients in the sediment. Um, they will. OK. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. I was just going to comment, because I know Gert Potters is here, and we were talking about this earlier this week. In terms of anthropogenic influence, there are sites now coming to light where we're seeing essentially the same corrosion process, we think, but with very different initiation um, routes, starting with iron oxidizing bacteria. And I won't say any more than that, because that's Gert's work. But this is considerably more complex than we've seen just by looking at three UK sites. And it will keep us busy for some time. Yeah, th thanks, Martin. Um, there was a question from Norman about, or, or a point perhaps, there's a question mark at the end of it, but I, I'm not sure if, if, if he and you have already discussed that question and, and maybe it's a question being thrown out to the geomicrobiologists in the audience, um, whether, whether they, they've got a comment on that. Um, while they chew, chew that one over, perhaps, we'll, we'll move on down to Antoine's question. Um, Antoine, do you want to unmute and, and ask your question, please? Yes, hello. Hello, uh, thank hello. you for your welcome. talk. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, yes, I was wondering uh, why are these bacteria coming to colonize the steel surface in the first place? Is it because they get an electron donor such as hydrogen from the steel corrosion? I think it's probably organic matter, to be honest. Um, you know, the, we're always seeing algae films. We're always seeing um, invertebrate colonization of the surfaces. 
where this happens. So we haven't tested for hydrogen production, um, but I, you know, there is no shortage of organic matter everywhere we've seen this occurring. So um, there's been quite a lot of work from Australia um, looking at this in relation to nitrate um, and the fact that nutrient as in some, a general nutrient tracer. So in terms of it occurring in harbour environments, nutrient contamination might be a major issue um, and be a major, you know, the major electron, um, yeah, in terms of the redox chemistry. So the the steel is just would be just providing a surface for biofilms to grow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, they they colonize very rapidly anyway. Um, again, we we got some ongoing experiments involving putting steel plates in to look at early stages of colonization. That's ongoing works. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Antoine. Um, I don't see any other questions. Norman has posted again and geared also in, in response to the, the, the ongoing discussion. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to Norman to unmute if he, if he feels he wants to, to come in here and offer anything additional. Um, uh, yeah, just to just say we noticed uh, bioturbation going well down into the anoxic sediment. So um, uh, that's probably allowing seawater to come down to those depths and then further sulfate reduction. So we can get uh, percentage levels over 1% of sulfur in the, uh, the sediment, um, which is quite interesting. Um, I, I made a previous comment about um, South End on Sea, which is mainly sandy sediment, uh, although where we've sampled actually it's more muddy. But um, uh, I'm just thinking that it'd um, be useful to do more comparison with sandy sites to see if um, the uh, accelerated corrosion is is largely related to you know where we've got calcareous muds um, along the channel coast. We did have an earlier incarnation of this work that was going to look at a very right, wide range of ports, but... Uh, that went the way of all projects that don't get funded. So, so, so at, at the outset, Martin, you said, um, you know, you're, you're, you're hoping to find the problem and then find find the solution. And and I, I know you haven't quite got a solution yet, though. I think you're you're leaning towards uh, the organic matter as the source of the yeah. problem. Um, um, what, what what do you what do you think you can do about that? Is it a case of avoiding but, yeah. the, the worst places or, or finding a there are solutions. They are either very expensive or um, potentially environmentally damaging or both. If, if the organic matter is a major issue, then we can look at biocides. But, um, you know, painting marine infrastructure with tributyl tin is not something we want to promote further. Um, there are electrochemical approaches, sort of the nodic and cathodic protection, where you try and change the electrochemical cell. But that means installing infrastructure and part of the, the cost rationale for this, if you go to somewhere like Shoreham, that has eight kilometres of steel pile wall, and that is a small port. That's not Portsmouth or Dover. Um, so protecting that all that distance with electrochemical techniques isn't really feasible. Um, and what we hope to produce, and part of the aim of this is risk. Um, you know, can we produce cheap ways to monitor low cost routes to monitoring that allow risk predictions to be made so we can target the expensive techniques because they do it, you know, there are ways to cope with this. Um, but for the scale of steel, con construction steel in marine environment, um, you can't protect every single inch of it. So. All right, I, I don't see any other questions coming through on the chat, Martin. Th thank you very much again for, for this afternoon. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, for those of you for whom this is your, your first um, uh, day joining um, the Open Geoscience talk, I, I will send you a link to the, uh, to the other talks that we've, we've recorded in the past. You, you may be interested to go and visit them. You can also pay a visit to the MINSOC website and, and learn all the good stuff that we do there as well. So uh, thanks for joining and thanks again, Martin. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much.